In the meantime, you have the entry of uh, the joint into Poland. But the entry into Poland stopped really, or rather became terribly difficult in, from 1929 on, because 1929, of course, is the collapse at, in the, the Wall Street, the start of the Great Depression, and the joint received less and less money from American Jews. And so it couldn't distribute money that it didn't have. What should they do? And the answer was to help with very, very small sums of money to large numbers of people. Uh, there were two main sorts of uh, loan organizations, specially developed in Poland, but also in Romania, in the easternmost part of interwar Czechoslovakia and elsewhere, where uh, in part these were loan casas where people uh, contributed uh, money and then the joint uh, contributed 50% uh, uh, and sometimes more and people had to take out, could take out loans at a low rate of interest and then return them. But there were also free loan casas which were based on the old East European system of Gmilut Chesed. In other words, these were loan casas with, that did not charge any interest and where all that was required was after a certain period of years to return the loan. Uh, the interest was basically paid by the joint. And these loan casas developed all over interwar Poland, which was a place where Jews were increasingly uh, poverty-stricken and in the 1930s, one can say without exaggeration, hungry. By 1937-38, one can say without any exaggeration that about one-third of Polish Jewry was on or under the poverty level and many of them on and under the hunger level. There were places in Poland where Jews Jewish kids didn't go to school because they didn't have shoes and school is in the winter. There were places in, uh, in, in Poland where people were totally desperate and they wanted to get out. They wanted to get out of Poland. In 1939, there were 3.3 million Jews in Poland. And uh, they were not religious. I mean, this is nostalgic nonsense. Uh, orthodoxy declined. In 1938-39, in internal elections to Jewish communities, 38% of the Jews voted for the anti-social, anti-Zionist and anti-religious Bund, socialist Bund. 35% voted for the uh, mutually uh, uh, for mutual enemies within the Zionist movement. The Zionist parties, as you all know, didn't talk to each other and fought each other tooth and nail. Together, and they never were together, 35%. Uh, 23% voted for the Orthodox. This idea, you know, that all Jews in Poland were Orthodox Jews with long side locks and black kaftans is nostalgic nonsense. Which didn't mean to say that these people didn't exist. They were very important. One quarter of them, one quarter of Polish Jewry openly identified with them. Doesn't mean to say that the Jews were not religious. The typical story that I can tell you is that of the Bundes in eastern Poland. In other words, the person who voted for the socialist, you know, anti-religious, anti-Zionist Bund, who in the morning went to shul, uh, at lunchtime, he went around with the blue-white box collecting money for the Zionists. And in the afternoon, he was part of the Bundes demonstration against the rabbis. There was no contradiction there. Jewish communists ate kosher meals. Why? Because the grandmother and grandfather ate kosher. So they ate kosher too. Not everyone, but many of them. And I can give you chapter and verse for that. So. Within that kind of a situation, there was no address to which the joint could send money in Poland. It had to do it itself. 
Why was there no address? Because the Bundists didn't talk to the Zionists, the Zionists didn't talk to the Orthodox, and the Orthodox didn't talk to the Bundists. This is typical Jewish life. There is no such thing as a united Jewish people. We are a culture, civilization, that exists because it constantly quarrels within itself. If we cease quarreling, we cease to exist. This call for Jewish unity, I always tell people, is a, is a uh, uh, prescription for disaster. We have to quarrel, because that is the basis on which our civilization develops. We didn't have just one Talmud, we had to have two. One in Babylon and one in Jerusalem, because they couldn't agree with each other. We didn't have just one state, we had to have two. Judah and Israel. We didn't have just one uh, East European Orthodoxy. We had Hasidism and traditional uh, Lith Lithuanian Orthodoxy because we couldn't agree with each other. And so on and so forth. There never was a united American Jewry. Forget about it. And there isn't one today. And that's a very good thing. And that was the case in Poland. But the joint demanded to have somebody to whom they could send the money to distribute it. They had an office in Warsaw, and of course Polish Jewry was the largest group of Jews outside of the United States. And uh, they conducted negotiations, the joint, between these three mainstreams in Polish Jewry, until finally they succeeded. And a cable was sent to the center of the joint in Paris, which was the center of the European uh, joint. Of course, directed from America. And the uh, cable said, we have a, un a, a, co a cooperation now between the three streams. We have a committee that represents all of, co uh, of Polish jury for social welfare purposes. The problem was that the date of the cable was well, the 2nd of September 1939, one day after the outbreak of World War II. It was too late. Jews were too late. Now, it wasn't only in Poland that the joint was active. The joint was active in Germany. After all, the leadership of the joint came, they or their parents or grandparents, from Germany. And in fact, the two major figures that led the joint that is Felix Warburg until 1937, and then uh, Berwald, Berwald, both had been born in Germany. So when the Nazis rose to power, this was obviously a major concern. Again, the people in the joint realized the danger of the uh, rise of Nazism before the Nazis came to power. The head of the joint in, 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 in Europe was a man by the name of Bernard Kahn, born in Sweden of German-Jewish parentage. He belonged to the same kind of social environment that the leaders of the joint belonged to. And Bernard Kahn in 1932, a year before Hitler came to power, said, this is likely the end of German Jewry. The Nazis have every uh, chance of reaching power and that will be the end of organized jury in Germany. He wasn't be people didn't believe him in America, but he was right. And when Hitler came to power, the joint in Germany too, like in Poland later, asked for a united Jewish organization. There was none. There was no, kind of, there was no such thing as German jury. There were German Jews. But there was no German jury. Again, the Orthodox wouldn't talk to the liberals, the liberals wouldn't talk to the Zionists, and so on. And so in April 1933, three months after Hitler came to power, finally they managed to establish a social welfare organization. Not everybody was included, of course. The Orthodox wouldn't participate, because it was led by the liberals. The Zionists did with uh, some reservations. 
And then in September 33, finally, they established a united German Jewish representation, which wasn't united either. Because the extremes, radical orthodoxy on the one hand, and radical assimilated na German ja nationalists of Jewish descent on the other hand, wouldn't join. So even then there was no united Jew uh, German Jewry, but at least there was an address to which the Joint could send money. And from 1933 to 1938, about one third of the expenditure on social welfare and on emigration of German Jewry came from the Joint, despite the fact that the Joint had less and less money. 